we let theta hat to be theta of x1, x2 up to xn be our estimate. We define minimax risk as follows. There is some loss function D between the estimated value and the true value. This could be perhaps a squared error right, between the estimate and the true value or any other uh, distance function. Uh, we take the expected value of this with respect to P. So if you fix p, theta of p is fixed, but theta hat is random because it is a function of the samples which are generated iid uh, from the same distribution. Then what we do is we take the supremum over p. So we look for the worst case distribution that maximizes this expected error between the estimate and the true value. And then we try to find the best possible estimator. We find, try to find an estimator theta hat that minimizes this worst case risk. So we have a supremum over p and an infimum over theta hat. And this is defined as Rn of p. Rn of p is defined to be this quantity. This is our minimax risk. N denotes the sample. This capital P, I should make it squiggly P, denotes a family of distributions, which we would know. We know that our true distribution belongs to some family. Um, then we have some estimator theta hat, and we want to know how good this estimator is. And so we look at the worst case distribution in this family that maximizes the expected risk. And then we are allowed to minimize this. So, our focus is on lower bounds, on Rn of p. Okay. So we want to find, we want to show that a problem is inherently high, meaning that we want to lower bound this quantity. It says that no matter what estimator you select, the minimax risk is going to be greater than some threshold. The other part is to develop upper bounds. Typically, you can get upper bound by plugging in any esti given estimator theta hat. And depending on the problem, you would have some intuition as to what is the right solution. So if you do that, then you can just have to compute the supremum, and that's usually not hard to do. Uh, we'll do a one or two examples on that, how to compute the upper bounds. But most of the focus is on lower bounds, which is the hard problem. How to provide a fundamental lower bound on this quantity that is independent of a choice of the estimator theta hat. This is where information theory comes in. Okay, so our focus is on the lower bounds. So we we'll start with one very a simple but widely used lower bound called the LeCam method. So this method is used to provide a lower bound on the minimax risk. And the idea here is that we select any two distributions P0 and P1 in this set. The set could be very large, countably infinite, but we select two distributions, P0 and P1. And we let delta to be the distance between the parameters associated with these two distributions. So theta is the parameter of interest. We look at the distance between them. And what this result says is that our minimax risk, Rn of p, can be lower bounded in terms of our choice of p0 and p1. It is greater than delta over 4 times the integral of the minimum of p0 of x1 to xn p1 of x1 to xn, we take the minimum, times dx1 to dxn. And this can be further lower bounded 
by delta over 8 times e to the minus n times the kullback leibler divergence between t0 and t1. So this is really the low, this is just an intermediate step, but from going to here, from here to here is a standard calculation. So what this says is that the minimax risk is lower bounded by delta, which is the distance between theta of t0 and theta of t1, and e to the minus n d t0 at t1. So this is a lower bound, so we want this to be as large as possible. Uh, if we make T0 and T1 to be very far apart, delta will be large because it's a distance between the associated parameters. However, there is a competing term here in terms of the kullback leibler divergence. The kullback leibler divergence will also be large and this quantity will decrease exponentially with n. n is the number of samples you have. Okay? So if you make the, the distributions to be very far apart, this quantity increases, but this dramatically decreases, and your minimax risk to be very small, the lower bound, which might not be useful. If we make them very close to each other, then this quantity will be small, so the exponent will not be very small because of the minus term. However, then the distance between the parameters will be small, and so delta will be small. So there is a tension in choosing T0 and T1. We cannot make them very close to each other because then delta will be very small. We cannot make them too far apart from each other because then the kullback leibler divergence will be large and this quantity will be small. And usually the sweet spot that we obtain is by simply selecting the following. So in practice, P0 and P1 are selected such that the relative entropy between P0 and P1 is close to 1 over n, so that this exponential term then basically uh, becomes a constant when you multiply, so this exponent does not hurt us in n, and delta is as large as possible. Subject to this constraint, we want delta to be as large as possible. So that is usually how we select P0 and P1. So let's do an example to see how this bound can be applied and then we will establish the lower bound. We'll do the proof of this, but first let's see how this can be used in practice. And typically this form is widely used, although we will only prove this, this one. And then from here to here is a simple calculation which we won't do. You can see that in any text. So we, for the proof, we will prove this part, but when we apply the bound, we will use the second inequality. Okay, so we'll do the simplest example, which is the case when you have noisy observations of some uh, uh, like a, uh, of some unknown parameter. The example is the following, theta is uniform, theta is between 0 and 1, it's the unknown parameter that we want to estimate. Uh, each, we observe n samples of the form theta plus zi, where i is in the set 1, 2 up to capital N. So we observe n noisy observations of this parameter theta, which we know is between 0 and 1. And now, how would you estimate? Our goal is to estimate theta. That is, we want to have an estimator theta hat of x1 to xn that is close to theta. And the distance metric that we will use is just the squared error. So what is the most natural way of estimating theta? You have n observations. Each one is the, original, the unknown parameter theta plus some Gaussian noise. I should say ZI is our IID, Gaussian with zero mean and say variance sigma square. What is the most natural way of estimating theta? If you had only one observation, if n was one, you observe x1 x to be theta plus z1. And from that you have to estimate theta. It's not too much you can do. You can say, say for example, theta is x1, right? One cannot really add. If you have two samples, theta plus z1 and theta plus z2, what will you do? 
how will you try to reduce the noise? You take the average, right? Because when you take the average, the noise variance will decrease by half and so on. So the most natural estimator is this one. This will give you theta plus 1 over n summation of zi. Let's call this effective noise. Then what is the variance of, of the effective noise? It will be sigma square by n. The variance decreases by n, right? So now you have an estimate which is the original uh, parameter plus a noise whose variance is 1 over n times the noise of any given observation, the variance of any given observation. So noise reduces by a factor of 1 over n. So expected value of theta minus theta hat square in this case is basically expected value of z effective square, which is uh, uh, sigma square by n. So if you look at the minimax risk, This was infimum over theta hat, supremum over p, or in this case p is theta, supremum over theta, okay. Expected value of theta minus theta hat square. So if we plug in this estimator, if we plug in uh, this particular estimator for theta hat, so then we don't, we get an upper bound on the, because we are replacing this with one particular choice of theta hat. In that case, theta minus theta hat square is independent of theta and it's always sigma square by n. So this is sigma square by n. So an upper bound on the minimax risk uh, decreases as sigma square by n. It is 1 over n, so that's the scaling in terms of the number of samples, and the numerator is sigma square. So now we want to establish a corresponding lower bound using the Lee Camps method, this theorem that I just mentioned. So what we will do is we will choose, make two guesses for theta, and we will apply the Lee Camps method in order to see what lower bound we can get. We won't quite get to this, but we will get at least the right scaling. We will show that the scaling is 1 over n. There are other methods that show this is optimal and so on, but uh, for Lee Camps method, we will get the right scaling. So we'll apply lower bound using Lee Camps method. So here we have to first identify what the set P is. The set P is basically the set of all distributions where the mean is theta and the noise variance is sigma squared. Any sample comes from this. Right? So when I say that P belongs to P, the distribution belongs to P, it is equivalent to choosing theta in 0 to 1. That is sort of 1 to 1 correspondence between the choice of theta and the distribution. So, I can write P theta, in other words, to be Gaussian, it mean uh, theta and variance sigma square. So, now what I will do is, I will select two choice values, theta 0 and theta 1, in the interval 0 to 1. The question is, how should I select them? In Lee Camps method, I have to select two distributions. So I will select two values in this interval 0 to 1, okay, so that the lower bound is optimized. Now my D of theta 0 and theta 1 is just going to be theta 0 minus theta 1 square. This is the delta, the lower bound of Lee camp. Also I have to compute the relative entropy term between P theta 0 and P theta 1. So this is the relative entropy between two Gaussians. Okay. This relative, so P theta 0 
this Gaussian with mean theta zero and median sigma squared, E theta one is Gaussian with mean theta one and median sigma squared. This is the relative entropy term. Um, so what we are trying to do is identify the parameters in the lower bound. This is the lower bound. It depends on the distance between the two parameters we have and the relative entropy term. So the distance here is just the square. Once I fix theta 0 and theta 1, the distance is just the square. The relative entropy requires a little bit more work. It's basically the relative entropy between two Gaussians. And this has a nice closed form expression, just like entropy of a Gaussian has a nice closed form expression. The relative entropy has a nice closed form expression. And it turns out that it is just the difference between the means square divided by 2 times the variance. For any two multivariate Gaussians, there is a nice formula. This is a special case of that formula where the variances are identical and it's a univariate Gaussian where the means are theta 0 and theta 1. So it's a difference between the mean square divided by 2 times sigma square. So you just use it. You can do this calculation offline or you can just look up online the proof. It's very easy. Just plug in the definition and simplify. Okay, so now what we need is we need to set according to our rule of thumb, we need to set d p theta 0 p theta 1 to be 1 over n, something like 1 over n. Okay, and so what that means is that we sh should select theta 0 and theta 1 so that the difference square is 2 sigma square by n. The left hand side is this quantity, so we are setting this to 1 over n. So theta 0 minus theta 1 square is 2 sigma square by n. So the points should be sufficiently close to each other, so the relative entropy is not large. Okay, any questions? So this tells me what this quantity is. Now, if I go back to Lee Camp's method, this is greater than delta times e to the minus n d p theta 0 p theta 1. This is the lower bound I want to apply. It's delta by 8. Okay. Now I have computed what delta is. Delta is just this quantity, which is 2 sigma square by n. And we, we chose this to be equal to this product to be 1. So this is e to the uh, e to the minus 1. So this quantity was set n times d p theta 0 p theta 1 equals 1. So that's why you have e to the minus 1 here. And delta is theta 0 minus theta 1 square, which you get as 2 sigma square by n. So you get similar result. You get something like 2 sigma square over n times e. You could optimize the constants if you want. This, is, this might not be the best. You can put a C here and play with that constant and optimize it, but that's not the point. The point is you do get the right scaling. Uh, lower bound also decreases as 1 over n. The upper bound decreases as 1 over n, the lower bound. And typically in this literature, you only look at the scaling loss of how your bounds scale with the number of samples. So, any questions? Did I miss anything? Oh, eight, eight, okay, that's right. So in this literature, people are not too worried about constants. They just look at the scale. Even if you get the right scaling in the number of, the number of samples, you are more than happy. This Getting lower bounds is considered to be like a fairly interesting research problem. Getting every lower bound will lead to a new, like, you know, solid paper 
at least a community will really be excited about. Not a huge community, but there is a community that is very excited about these bounds. Okay, so getting lower bounds for many different, like if you have sort of a nice problem in machine learning, getting lower bounds using these methods requires a lot of ingenuity. This is just a very simple example, and that will sort of create interest. So we'll see how some of these bounds can be. So Rn of the lower bound. Scales as order of one over n as well. Okay, so now we have seen how the bound can be applied. Uh, now we will prove the Likams method. We'll prove the lower bound. Next thing we'll do is we'll provide a proof of Likams method. So we'll assume n to be 1, the argument can be easily generalize to any n, any number of samples. So we'll assume there is one sample, x is sampled from px, and we will let theta hat to be now theta of x. So in the original problem statement, we had arbitrary number of samples, i, i, d, drawn from the same distribution. But for simplicity, we just assume there is one sample x drawn from px and prove the bound in that setting, and it the general case will follow immediately. So we'll assume that theta 0 and theta 1 have been selected. So let's say this is theta 0 and theta 1. These are the parameters that we have selected for our lower bound. Let's say the distance between them is delta. That's the definition. So delta is d of theta 0 and theta 1. And we make some estimate. Let's say the estimate that we make is perhaps here. There is some estimate that we make. Let's say the estimate falls somewhere here, right? It may, might not equal theta 0, it might not equal theta 1. Now what we will do is, we will define a decision function as to deciding whether theta 0 was the true parameter or theta 1 was the true parameter. So we will say that I'm only interested in theta 0 or theta 1 and I will make a decision between them. So psi x will be 1 if the distance between theta hat and theta 1 is less than the distance between theta hat and theta 0. And it will be 0 if the other case is true. So what we have right now is an estimator that estimates theta hat from this one sample. I'm going to convert this estimation problem into a detection problem. So I'm going to make a decision given this sample whether theta 0 is the true parameter or theta 1 is the true parameter. Okay? And the way I do it is I say that if my distance, so I will implement this, decision, this estimation function and then I look at theta hat. If theta hat happens to be closer to theta 0 than theta 1, I say that theta 0 was the true distribution that generated x. Otherwise, I will say that theta 1 is the true distribution that generated x. Now, the key idea is that we can lower bound our estimation error in terms of the detection error. So what we will show is the following. So let's say P0 was the true distribution. So P0 is basically P of theta 0 
t1 is p of theta 1. And we look at the average estimation error when theta 0 was the true uh, uh, parameter. So this is the estimation error we will get between the, our estimate at theta 0 and we look at the expected error under p0. That is the true distribution. What we will show is that this is greater than delta by 2 times the probability that we make the output to be 1. This is what we will show, that the estimation error under P0, meaning theta 0 was the true parameter, is greater than this constant delta, delta by 2, times the probability that P0 is the true distribution, but we make a decision that the output parameter is a 1 instead of 0. So this quantity on the right hand side is the, but I should not include delta, this is the probability of detection error when theta 0 is the true parameter. And this is the estimation error under theta 0. We have no information about the prior distribution of whether it's theta 0 or theta. No, we won't. We don't need it. So if we don't even know if actually theta is theta 0 or theta 1 or some other theta, but we'll see why this is still useful. Okay, we are saying if theta 0 was the true parameter, then clearly this is the estimation error if theta 0 generated x. This is if theta 0 was the true parameter, this is our detection error. This is, I'm going to be wrong, I'm not setting psi x to be 0, I'm setting psi x to be 1. So this will be my error if theta 0 was the true parameter under the de de detection problem. And delta is just the distance between them. So we will show this, okay, we'll also show that this is greater than delta by 2 times p1, that psi x equals 0. So this is basically the complementary uh, case. This is saying that the true parameter was theta 1, theta hat was my output, this is the estimation error under theta 1, that is going to be lower bounded, that cannot be too small, so that is lower bounded by delta over 2 times p1, that psi x is 0. So this is the probability I make an error when theta 1 was the this is how it is, right? Theta naught is the parameter that we want to produce, and we'll say associated with theta naught there is a distribution uh, p zero. So, like if you do look at this example, theta was this parameter, and p theta was basically. So, is that? We are just looking at those sort of. I think generally, like, if not, then if, if there is not a one-to-one -one mapping, you can, this bound still applies. You just have to write it a bit more formally. But we are interested in theta. Maybe there are multiple p's mapping to the same theta. Is that probably a question? Yeah. Like, then I think the same argument can hold. You just select one of them. Okay, so we will prove this, but... This is actually an easy calculation, so we will first show why is this useful. So let's go to the lower bound. The lower bound is infimum over theta hat, supremum. Oh, this was the lower bound, right? Now P could be a very complicated set. This P could be very large, it could be uncountably infinite. There is no such thing, right? Now what we do is we select some P0 and P1 in this set P. So then if we just say in this, instead of taking the supremum over all P, 
we'll just take the supremum over two distributions, P0 and P1. Now, fixing P0 and P1, and instead of taking supremum over all elements in P, I just take the maximum with respect to P0 and P1. You can always do that, and that's going to be a lower bound. So what I will do is I'll take the maximum of EP0 So here the supremum was over every p in p. What I'm doing here is I'm replacing that whole supremum with respect to just two distributions, p0 and p1. Then what happens? The supremum can be lower bounded by the maximum over those two distributions. Okay, so that I can always do. I have selected two of them. Now what I will do is I will use this lemma. And this is now going to be greater than the infimum over theta hat times the maximum over P0 and P1 of delta by 2 times P0, that's Ix equals 1, and delta by 2 times P1 that's i x equals 0. Okay. So what we did is the first term is lower bounded by, this is the estimation error under P0. That is lower bounded by the detection error under P0. The second term is the estimation error under P1. That is lower bounded by the detection error. This is from the previous claim, which will eventually prove. I'm just going to showing you how this is useful. Okay. okay, so so far so good. Now what we do is we replace the maximum by the average. Will that be an upper bound or a lower bound? We replace the maximum by the average. So lower bound, right? So now I can, I, delta is common, so I can write it as delta by 4, infimum over th theta hat, P0, psi x equals 1, plus P1, psi x equals 0. Okay. So now this infimum is a little bit funny, right? I am first committing to an estimator. I am committing to the estimator theta hat. And then I am defining my decision rule based on psi is a function of theta hat. This is how psi was defined. So, yeah, psi was defined here. It's, I should strictly put theta hat here in this, as a superscript because psi depends on theta hat. So what I'm doing is I'm saying I'm first going to com commit to one estimation function. Then I'm defining my detection rule in this way. And then I'm going to select the best estimation rule that minimizes this sum. So this is sort of a complicated thing. So why don't I just directly take the minimum over all decision functions? Why should I first define an estimation function? and then decide my decision rule. So I can de do something more by taking the infimum, not over theta hat, but the infimum over all decision rules psi. This is more direct, and that is directly allowing me to minimize the quantity of interest. So I'll take the infimum over P0, psi x equals 1, plus P1, psi x equals 0. This is clearly a valid thing. I'm just taking infimum direct. Now, not all, every infimum here will, can be expressed is in this form, but so I'm taking an infimum over a larger set here, and that directly affects my decision rule. So this is a clearly a valid thing to do. So this is my lower bound. 
I have x which is drawn either from p0 or p1. It's one of them. Okay. If I am under p0, my error probability is this quantity. Under p1, my error probability is this probability, this uh, quantity, and I'm summing them, summing them up. So you can think of x being drawn from p0 with probability half now, x being drawn from p1 with probability half, and you want to minimize the average probability of error. That's the Bayesian interpretation. So you're saying there's no bijection between the estimators and the decisions? Not necessarily. Right? This is a, this could be a larger because here psi x was <coughs> like when we defined the decision rule here, it was defined in terms of some estimation function theta hat. And then I had this nearest decision rule, right? I was that need not be optimal depending on the distributions. Right? So there is no. So this is in general. There was a very sort of specific way we were making the decision here, and that may or may not be optimal. So, but this lower bound is always valid. So what do we do next? Well, uh, we want to minimize. We want to minimize this quantity. But this turns out to be like a classical hypo problem in hypothesis testing. This is the average error of a random variable which is selected from p0 or p1. This is with probability half. And we want to minimize the Bayesian error, the average error probability. And this is a problem called the Neiman Pearson. The Neiman Pearson rule minimizes this quantity. So I won't do the proof of it, but I'll just show you the visually how it looks. Imagine that this is P0 and this is P1. And this is x. Okay. So imagine these are the two distributions. Okay. You sample x either from p0 or if you sample from p0, this will be your output. Like your distribution will be this. If you sample from p1, your distribution is this. Now you don't know which was which one was used to sample. Uh, but you want to now compute a decision rule. To minimize the average probability of error. So you get some x somewhere here, maybe you get an x in here. And you want to decide whether x came from p1 or x came from p0 with the aim of minimizing the average error probability. And the decision rule is fairly natural and intuitive. You basically partition the region like this. Wherever P0, this is the region where P0 is less than P1. This is the region where P0 is greater than P1. Wherever P0 is less than P1, you say that psi x equals 1. The decision rule is 1 because P1 is more likely than P0 in this part. And wherever P0 is greater than P1, psi x will be 0. This is the optimal decision rule. So you are getting some x here. So in this point, you will say that here you just look at P1 and P0. P1 is greater than P0. So your decision rule here is 1. If you get a point anywhere to the left of this line, psi x will be 0 because p0 is greater than p1. You just look at which probability has, uh, whether p0 or p1 has a higher value. And you make your decision based on that. In that case, can anyone tell me what this quantity will be? This is what we want to bound. So this is the optimal decision rule. So, so the point here is that Solving for this infimum is easy. You know what the solution is from Neumann Pearson lemma. Like this infimum becomes easy, and it says that you at any given point just check which whether p0 is greater than p1 or p1 is greater than p0. 
and select the, the, the sort of hypothesis which has a higher probability at that point. Okay. So now we want to know what this quantity is. So this is the probability that you make an error under P0, if P0 was the true sort of distribution. This is the probability that you make an error if P1 was the true distribution. So can anyone tell me geometrically what this quantity is in this plot? The area under the These two, right? Yeah, so P0 psi x equals 1 means that you are somewhere here, you are to the right of this line, and centered it by P0. So it's this quantity here. P1 psi x equals 0 is basically this quantity up here. So this quantity is the integral over all x. We take the minimum of P0 of x and P1 of x dx. If you go for over all x, to the left of this line, the integral you will be integrating with respect to P1 which is a smaller event, which has a smaller probability, to the right of this line, you'll be integrating with respect to P0. So you could equivalently say that you integrate over all x and integrate the minimum of P0 and P1 of x. This is the same thing. This is the actual error probability you get for Neumann PLC. So if you take a class in detection and estimation theory, you will prove all these results. You prove the optimality of Neumann Pearson, from first principles, here I just give you an intuitive sort of idea of why this is sort of the right rule to use and why the error probability is given by this. Now, if you had n samples, the what you have is basically exactly the same thing, but you will have to bound this quantity. Okay. And this will be the integral of the minimum over P0 of x1 to xn, P1 of x1 to xn, dx1 to x. So everything just generalizes immediately. You will just be doing an n-dimensional integral. Wherever x1 to xn has a higher probability under P0, you will set psi x to be P0. Otherwise, you will set psi x to be P1. But you will exactly get the same. The same. There is nothing special about one sample in this whole derivation. The derivation just applies immediately to any number of samples. And then from here, the last part is to show that this is greater than delta by 8 e to the minus n d p0 and p1. And we'll skip that step. This is just a, basically just a mathematical calculation. And you can see any reference on it. Um, you won't do that. But this is what is like intuitive, how, how the LeCamp method works. This is just an algebraic calculation which makes the analysis easier. So the only missing part now is this claim. We did not prove this claim yet. So we, to complete the proof, we have to now show that the claim 1, the proof of claim 1. So we want to show that the expected value of d of theta hat and theta naught is expected value okay, uh, so what we do is first we want to show that this is greater than delta by 2 p0 psi x equal to 1. This is what we need to prove. 
So we want to convert the estimation error into a detection error. That is what needs to be done. And so the trick here is to remember that this picture we had theta 0, theta 1, theta hat is somewhere here. Okay. And so what we do is I can consider this quantity and this is a lower bound on the left hand side. Why is this a lower bound on the left hand side? So I want to take this expectation but I multiply it by an indicator function. The indicator function is 1 if psi x equals 1, it is 0 if psi x equals uh, 0. Okay, so this is clearly less than or equal to 1 every time. So if I multiply by something, I get a lower bound. And now we just integrate x. This is d theta hat of x theta naught 1. psi x equals 1, p0 of x dx, we take the integral with respect to p0 of x, because that was the distribution that generated x. So this is the integral, I can take the indicator function on in the domain over all x such that psi x equals 1, d theta hat of x and theta naught, p0 of x and dx. Okay. Now for every x where psi x equals 1, I know that theta hat is far from theta naught. Because my decision rule is if I, this is distance delta, say this is delta by 2 here, if I am to the left hand side, then I will set theta hat to be theta 0. If I am to the right hand side, I am going to set theta hat to be theta 1 or psi x to be theta 1. So this means that this quantity here is at least delta by 2. Because I have to be on the right hand side. So this is greater than delta by 2, the integral over x such that psi x equals 1, p0 of x dx. So now I'm integrating over all x where my decision is 1. This thing comes out, it's a constant, p0 x dx. But this is exactly the probability of error. The integral is exactly p0 that psi x equals 1. This is the probability that I make a decision to be 1 under distribution p0. And the same way we can prove the other side. So this basically now concludes the proof of the LeCam method. Is delta the square of the distance or is it just the distance? Delta is just the distance. Just Whatever d is, delta is that quantity. Okay, I see. And so why isn't it equal to delta? This thing? Yeah. Because any, if you are anywhere in the right, you will declare psi x to be 1. So it's lower, it's at least delta by 2. If you are at the boundary, it's delta by 2. If you are to the right of it, or to the left of it, the distance is small, but that's not included in this product. The product will be 0 there. So that's all there is. Okay? So we'll do one more example, or at least we'll set up the example and do the calculations after the taking a 10 minute break. Any questions before we move? Okay. So imagine that you have n examples, x1, y1, x2, y2, 
up to x n y n sample i i d from p x y here p x is uniform in the interval 0 to 1 p of y given x is gaussian with some mean mx and variance 1 so you observe n examples x1 y1 x2 y2 each x coordinate is uniform between 0 and 1 and each y given x is going to be sampled from a gaussian with a function mx mx is also unknown to us and variance 1 Depending on x, you have a mean mx. Now we will assume that mx is unknown and it satisfies the Lipschitz constraint. That is, if you look at the difference between my minus mx, it's going to be less than L times y minus x. The function does not change very abruptly. This is like saying that the first derivative is upper bounded by L as well, if the function is differentiated. Okay. This is the setting. And let's simplify it a bit. Well, later when we do Fano's inequality, consider sort of the more general case. But for Lecamp's method, suppose we only want to estimate mx at x equals 0. That is, for any given uh, function mx, we only care about what the value is at x equals 0 in our uh, in our estimation. We don't care about what x is anywhere else. We may get samples at many different values of x, but the value of m that we care about in this particular setting is when x equals 0, just one point for simplicity. And d of th will take the absolute error And what we want to now bound is this quantity, the minimax race. So what this requires us to now do is to find two functions, say find m0 of x and m1 of x. We have to now come up with two functions. Okay. These functions have to be sufficiently far, have to be sufficiently far apart okay, so that uh, So if once you find two functions, the p's will be different, right? p1 will be m, p1 of y given x will be Gaussian with mean m1 of x and variance 1, p2 of y given x, or I have p0, yeah, I have p0 of y given x will be Gaussian with mean m0 of x and 1. Now our delta which is the distance between say theta of m0 and theta of m1. This is our delta that is going to be just m0 at 0 minus m1 at 0. So m0 and m1 are some functions between 0 and 1, right? So m0 might be, I don't know, some function like this, that is Lipschitz m1 might be some other function this might be m1 so we have to fix these two functions now what we care about in this setting is the gap between m0 and m1 
at the point at the origin this is our metric so let's say this was m m0 started at 0 m1 starts at epsilon so the distance between m0 and m1 here is at point 0 our estimator only looks at the, at the value at x equals 0 so this thing here in this case would be epsilon okay at the same time we want the relative entropy between p0 of xy and p1 of xy to not be too small. It should scale as 1 over n. So you can take, you can make this large, you can make this gap large, you can make m1 somewhere here, m0 somewhere here that will make this distance large, but then you also want the relative entropy between these two to scale as 1 over n. The question is how do you now wisely pick m0 and m1? It turns out that the followers, you should not pick them in a completely ad hoc way like this. Almost always in these problems, m0 of x will be set to the 0 function for all x in 0 to 1, and m1 of x will be of the following form. If this is 0 to 1, then m1 of x will be a function that will look like this. This is up to some epsilon, it is non-zero, and then it is zero. So this is m1 of x. What is the maximum value you can have here? That comes from the Lipschitz constraint. The slope here cannot be uh, larger than L, right? You cannot make this infinity. So you get L of epsilon. And you see that there is going to be a bit of a tension here. If you make epsilon large, then L epsilon will be larger and larger, which is good in terms of the distance. The gap here will now be L epsilon. So this is going to be your delta. M0, remember, is just all zero function. This is M0. Right? So the gap, your delta, is this quantity. This is the distance between M1 and M0 at point 0, the point where we care about uh, in our mini maximum. However, if you make epsilon large, what is going to happen? M0 will, M1 and M0 will be considerably different from each other. And that will hurt the relative entropy term. Because the relative entropy has a mean of M1 and M0. Right? The, the distributions have a mean. So if you make epsilon large, M0 is going to be further away from M1. And as a result, now what we need is that the distance between the two distributions should scale as 1 over n, and so epsilon will be selected so that it is not too far away such that the, the relative entropy here scales at 1 over n. That will tell us what epsilon to select. That will in turn determine delta, and we can compute the decap spot. Okay, so we'll do this calculation after the break. So for students who came in late, there is some announcement on the midterm. Let us know, let me know if you have any 